Be seated. Good morning, church. I hope that y'all are having a wonderful morning so far. And uh, this morning, I'm excited. We've got one that's coming for baptism. And uh, she knows that there's nothing special about this water, but it's the first step after a personal relationship with Jesus starts. And this is Miss Elena, and uh, she is seven years old. Her parents have been members here for several years now, and uh, she has been asking some just personal spiritual questions. They've been having some good conversations. And then after vacation Bible school, she came home and said, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And so this morning she comes to follow through with believer's baptism. And so Elena, it is my honor, but also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? It's upon that profession that I get the opportunity to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Well, we praise the Lord for that. And uh, this, so far this year, we're right at 170 that have followed through in believers' baptism. <laughs> we are thankful for that. And as Ryan tells me, Pastor, we got a boatload on the runway. Uh, I think that's Arkansas terminology. I don't know. But that, it's a good thing. Hey, not only do we have, uh, well, we baptized in the first service as well, but uh, yesterday, a member of our ABLE Choir, which is our special needs ministry choir, was baptized, and she had a cousin, I believe, was it a cousin, Pastor Wayne, that was baptized there with her? Her name is Grace. His name is Elijah. And so we have a video that we wanted to show you today as we celebrate with them following through in believers' baptism. Look at the screens and rejoice with Grace and Elijah this morning. All right, with that profession of faith, Lies, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grace, <laughs> it is my, my honor, but it's also my responsibility to ask you who is Lord of your life. Jesus Christ, that's right. I mean, with that profession of faith, I baptize you, Grace, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, we're so thankful, and we do. We rejoice. We know that baptism does not save, nor does it forgive one single sin, but it's the first act of obedience of a follower of Christ. And what a beautiful expression it is of being cleansed of all sin that has separated us from God. And so we do. We rejoice in that. And so thankful uh, that our church has this ministry that is so near and dear to my heart. Uh, let me go ahead and take this time to welcome you. If you're visiting with us today, we really, really appreciate. I know I've, I've got some friends here myself that are here at the beach. And I always tease and say when the world comes to us at the beach, we leave. And, uh, and we go to the mountains. The humidity, and, wow, July at the beach. I mean, it's glorious. You guys keep coming and spending your money. Um, but uh, anyway, where our students, we, uh, we have 100, actually over 100 high school students that were in the first service. They're normally in this service, but they came to the first service because they are leaving, getting on a bus, headed up to Asheville, North Carolina, and they'll be doing camp this week in Asheville. And so uh, they uh, brought some energy and some excitement to that first service. Uh, many of them told me that you guys would be dead today without them here in the service. So uh, I, I hope to be able to prove them wrong when we, as we continue in the service. But if you're visiting with us today, we would love to tell you about our church, love to answer any questions you may have. Please take the time, fill out one of our guest registration cards. You can find those located in the chair back pockets all around this room. You can fill that out. You can drop it in an offering bucket. It'll be passed in just a moment. Or you can bring it out to the Welcome Center as soon as the service is over, and we will put some information in your hand. We have a free gift that we would like to give to you as well. You can also fill out that card electronically. One of the very last slides that will come up on the screens at the end of the service today will be a slide where you can take out your phone and you can text the word guest to the phone number that's on the screen or you can also text uh, there's several words up there for spiritual decisions that you can text that goes directly to our staff they'll be reaching out to you to continue this conversation so whether you're a guest today or you make a spiritual decision we look forward to having that future conversation with you whether you fill out the card electronically or physically let us encourage you as well come by the welcome center let us give you more information we've got a little sweet treat that we would like to give you as well for being our guest today and if you brought somebody with you and if you bring them out there to the welcome center even if you have to drag them kicking and screaming we will give you a little sweet treat as well for being a bringer and a dragger today uh, we also this week we have 16 individuals that are headed out from Highland Park on a mission trip. And I'm going to make sure I, I, I say this right, and I'm sure I'm not going to say it right. But they're headed to Siguatepec. Did I get that right? Siguatepec? Siguatepec? It's Honduras, okay? <laughs> Siguatepec. There you go. Just say Honduras. 
Anyway, they'll be headed to Honduras. I'm going to ask them to come forward because we're going to have a time of prayer for them. And while they're in Honduras, they're going to be working with the Evangelical Ministries of America at the Seminary for the Preparation of Expository Preaching, which is near and dear to my heart. They'll be building and repairing dorm rooms. You guys come on down front right here. If you're a part of this mission trip, please join us down front. They're going to be building and repairing uh, dorm rooms at the seminary, and they'll be leading several events designed for the ladies. Uh, Luis Nunez, our director of women's ministries, will be going on the trip, and they'll be ministering there to the ladies of students as well as professors there in Honduras. And so we want to pray for them today. I want to go ahead and ask our ushers to go ahead and get ready as well, because this will be the time where we offer our prayer for our offering and um, let me encourage you guys to be faithful to give. It's because of your faithful and generous giving that we're able to do mission trips like this, and we're able to send over 100 students to high school ministry camp this week, and uh, we're blessed as a church to be able to invest in these lives. I'd like to ask as well, as our ushers are there, if some of you guys would just slip out from where you are, come down, let's gather around these 16, let's lay hands on them, and let's pray over them. Would y'all go ahead and do that? Some of you just slide out and come on out. Just a few of you be willing to, come on right now, let's go right now, and if you could come and join us up here. I know I'm doing everything out of order, so pray for your pastor today, all right? Let's gather around these individuals. Gather around them up front here as well. Let's lay hands on them and let's pray. And this will be our offertory prayer as well. Father God, today we thank you that we can gather around these individuals. And thank you, Father, for the week that you have already got designed. You tell us in your word that before we were ever even born, you fashioned our days. And Father, thank you for what you're going to do thank you for how you're going to use them to be your hands and your feet. Thank you for how you're going to draw them closer to you. Their faith is going to increase. Thank you, Lord, for for how you're going to use them to spread the good news and the gospel of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that you're going to use them this week to be able to just be an encouragement, to be a ministry to these families that are there on that seminary campus, these Honduran pastors these professors. Father, for how we will be able to be a blessing to them, for they have blessed so many. Our prayer is there would be safety, safety in their travel. Father, that there would be health and not sickness. And Father, our prayer is that you would do something so radical through them this week that even they would be in awe of your miracle working power. God, we pray for the many high schoolers that are getting ready to board the buses, make that trip to North Carolina. Keep them safe, Lord. Use this week to save some of them, Lord. Use this week as well to call some of them to full-time vocational ministry. And may you use this week to draw them all closer to you. God, may you be with Robbie and his team that lead. It may be a good week for them as well. Again, praying for protection, provision, praying for health. And God, right now, even as we take this offering, thank you for how you've blessed this church. You have blessed us in ways that only you could be glorified for. Thank you, God. Thank you. We pray that as we give back a portion of how you've blessed us, that you would use it as we spread the gospel of Jesus, not only across the world, but also across the street. We worship you today for you're the only one that is worthy of our worship. We exalt you, King Jesus, because there's no other name given to men under heaven by which we may be saved except the name of Jesus. So our prayer is all that's happening, not only in this room, but all across this campus, all that's happening at our many campuses and churches that we planted, our prayer is that Jesus, you would have your will in your way and that we would be talking about just how great of a God we serve. Thank you for loving us. We love you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We love you. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. 
when everything around me is shaken. I have never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why?
so this weekend, this is Matt Russell, this weekend, you've been a part of a, of a regional competition called Southern Lights, where hundreds of folks come so that the next person or the next star may be found or something along those lines. And he made it to the finals for the second year in a row. Uh, but as he told me this morning, I didn't get first or second. Uh, and I don't think they hand out anything past that. Um, and uh, here's what I love. Here's what I love. That as he was singing the last couple of nights, uh, the most important singing he's done all weekend is right here. Amen. Come on. And Corey's out this morning on vacation, and Matt doesn't normally play the guitar and sing, and he jumped in. And, uh, I mean, you, you may not have been first or second, but, uh, well, we think they missed it, okay? That's right. Uh, we think they missed it. But, and he doesn't like me. He doesn't like me saying all this. But, but that just came to my mind while this was taking place. And here's what I want to do. I want us to go back. I feel like, Adrian, you might have been holding back just a little. Because yeah. okay. I kind of know, know you pretty well, and I feel like you've, you've held back just a little. Maybe, maybe, Wayne, maybe we could come back to that where it starts talking about the dead in Christ rising and stuff like that. And uh, anyway, how about, how about we get more excited than anything you've seen this weekend? Absolutely. Okay, now let me remind you, if you take off running or you start talking in a language that we don't understand, you will get taste. But man, that'll, <laughs> that'll be exciting. That'll be exciting. They'll be talking about it out there. But, you know, in the world that we live in, and all the energy and power that happens around the world, there is not more power in any other place than when his people come to this place and the power is unbelievable. So maybe, can we, I know you, I threw you a curveball. We can do that, can't we, Wayne? All right, go ahead, praise the Lord. Let's sing one more time. Can we do that? Father God, we praise you and we praise you forever because you are the King of Kings. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this moment that we have, Lord, just to lift your name up. And thank you for your word this morning, Lord. And Lord, just, uh, Lord, just help us to understand what you have for us. And Lord, we understand without you, we can do absolutely nothing. But with you, all things are possible. So we ask for changed lives this morning. We just ask you to move all through this congregation and all through this room. We love you. We praise you, Lord, in the precious, powerful, mighty, amazing name of Jesus. Amen. May be seated. Hey Amen. I just remind you that uh, when I go along this morning, remember they wouldn't quit singing. Uh, 
If you have a Bible this morning, please open up John chapter 5. John chapter 5. This morning, uh, you know, a little intimidated preaching this morning to some of the greatest preachers that are in the world today. Uh, and I'm not talking about you, I'm sorry. Kevin, Kevin and Kim Ham are here visiting us from Birmingham. Where'd, where'd Kevin land? Yeah, he's stomping around somewhere. He's somewhere. Somewhere. Where is he? I can't see him. There he is, right up there in the nosebleed, he and his family. It wasn't supposed to rain yesterday. The weather showed great, and it rained all day. And I'm like, Kevin Ham has come to town. Let it rain. Let it rain. Um, also, uh, Brent Snook from Cincinnati, Ohio, and his family, a pastor there in Cincinnati. I don't know where Brent, there's Brent right there. And glad to have him with us today. What a great, great church. And then, uh, you know, as always, Pastor Johnny, uh, I love to hear preach as well. I don't know, did Benny make it in? Benny Tate. Benny's supposed to be here. Where's Benny? Is he here? All right. He didn't come. Well, we have to find out what's going on. That's the reason why you don't call people out, right? Hey, take your Bibles this morning, John chapter 5. Now, some of you guys are thinking, when I hang on, Pastor, we didn't finish John chapter 4. We had a little bit left. Well, then that is an indication you weren't here for Father's Day. Because remember, we jumped ahead on Father's Day. We talked about the faith of a father. And then I said, we're going to go back for a few weeks, and we're going to continue to talk about the woman at the well. And so today we find ourselves in John chapter 5. We're doing this verse-by-verse -verse series through the book of John. It is entitled, Life in His Name. And today we're going to look at another miracle of Jesus. You know, you've heard this said that there is always a parable in every miracle and a miracle in every parable. And today we're going to see that being the case. Look there with me, John chapter 5. We'll read the first 15 verses of John chapter 5. It says, And after this, there was the feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, and he took up his bed and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now here's a guy that's been laying on this bed for 38 years. He gets up, he's carrying it. And here are these legalistic Jews. You can't carry it today. Oh, oh, oh. I would have loved to have heard that conversation. It says in verse 11, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And then they ask him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn because a multitude was there in that place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, it could be this morning that you have a Bible translation that verse 4 is missing. It was not included in the original text. Or you have a translation to where verse 4 is talked about in a footnote at the bottom of the page. Let me give you a little understanding of what is taking place here. There at the pool of Bethesda, like other pools in Jerusalem, they're being fed by underwater springs, right? And so a lot of times the water would be coming down out of the mountains into these springs, and it would cause this effect to where the water would rise very high very quickly, or it would, 
it would go down very quickly, and it would cause a bubbling type effect. Now, the people there were very, very superstitious. And so they're like, oh, look, look, look. That is an angel stirring his finger in the water. And the very first one to go into the water after this occurs, they will be healed. It was superstitious. Now, a lot of Bible scholars say this, just as there are places today that are known for their healing capability and folks go and they do what they're supposed to do and they're healed, a lot of Bible scholars say that there were people that were healed at Bethesda, but it can be explained psychologically. For instance, they were there at a place that was known for healing. They did what they were expected to do. And then healing occurred, or psychologically, they were made well. We don't really know what is taking place here, but the Bible gives us a little insight into what they felt or what they believed or the superstition of that time. Now, Jesus comes along, right? And Jesus asked this man a key question. Do you want to be made well? Can I say that's the question he's asking to every one of us today? Do you want to be made well? And what we're going to see happen in this passage of Scripture is Jesus making this man well, and there are going to be different stages that we see that transpire in his life. And so today I want to ask you the question, do you want to be made well? Well, one does. Do you want to be made well? All right, just want to make sure, because if you don't, I might as well close up and we'll go to the house. Now, with that being said, if you want to be made well, first of all, just like this man, you've got to declare that you have a problem. Jesus changed this man's life, and Jesus wants to change your life as well. But first of all, you've got to admit you have a need. Jesus asked this lame man, do you want to be made well? How many of you, like me, were surprised by his answer? I mean, he had 38 years to think about this, right? I would have expected him to say, yes. (laughs) Yes, I want to be made well. Yes, I'm tired of laying here on this mat. Yes, I'm ready to get up and walk. Yes, I don't want to beg anymore. Yes, but notice he doesn't say that. Instead, he gives Jesus an excuse. I mean, yeah, but it's, it's not my fault. Because when the water bubbles up, I don't, I don't have anyone to put me into the water. And by the time I drag myself over there, somebody else has beat me to it. And, and they're the ones that's healed. And so here's this man. He finds himself in a, in a hopeless state. I would say we're a lot more like him than we care to admit You see, this man was physically disabled, and the reality is every single one of us are spiritually disabled. And before Jesus Christ can make you well, right, before Jesus Christ can transform you, before he can change you, then you have to declare, I have a problem. But you know what I found? It's a lot easier for us, instead of admitting we have a problem, we want to admit that somebody else has a problem. Don't we do that? Don't we like to focus, oh, no, no, not me. I'm fine. I I mean, I'm okay. I'm making. I mean, I'm not perfect. Everything's not great, but it's okay. I'm all right. I don't really, there's somebody else that they're in more, much worse shape than I am. I mean, man, that guy over there, he really needs to be made well. He really needs to be healed. But notice every single one of us need a change. I heard about a man who went to see a counselor He had strips of bacon hanging from both earlobes and a fried egg on his head. The counselor said, sir, how may I help you? And he said, oh, I haven't come for you to help me. No, no, I don't need any help. I'm doing fine. I've come to talk about my wife. She's crazy. We do that. We do that. But the question is, do you really want Jesus to help you? And in order for that to happen, you and I have to admit that I have a need, that we've got to be willing to say, Lord, I need help with my marriage. Lord, I need help with this habit. Lord, I need help with this relationship. Lord, I need help with this addiction. 
that even as Christians, that there are times that we are blind to our problems. When Jesus was addressing the seven churches in Revelation, he wrote to the church at Laodicea, and he spoke about their blindness to their own problems. L- listen to what he wrote. This is in Revelation 3.17. For you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you do not even realize that you are wretched, you are pitiful, you are poor, blind, and naked. So here they were, they were saying, Jesus, we're okay. Jesus, we don't have a problem. And Jesus said, you don't even realize that you have a problem, and you're poor, right, and you're naked, and you're blind, So if you really want to be made well, if you want there to be a change in your life, the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to admit, you've got to declare you have a problem. But then secondly, you're going to have to do the impossible. Do you really want to be made well? That's what Jesus asked this guy to do. He asked him to do the impossible. You're like, what was the impossible? You ask a lame man to get up and walk. Now, if we didn't know that Jesus was God in the flesh, we would say, how cruel. I can't believe that he would say that. This guy's been laying there for 38 years, and he's like, just get up and walk. Just take your mat. Just go on your way. Have you noticed, though, that Jesus always individualizes the cure? I love this. It's not this plug and play. It's not just this canned thing for everyone. Sometimes Jesus would heal people at a distance. Other times, in this case, he would be with the person being healed. Sometimes Jesus would touch a person. And sometimes, as in this case, he would just speak it, right? But he would always individualize the cure. And the same is true when Jesus deals with us, that Jesus deals with us in a variety of ways. And the reason is because we all have different problems and we all have have different needs. What is my problem is probably not your problem, and what is your problem is probably not my problem. There's a guy one time that went to a drugstore, and he walked up to the pharmacist, and he said, I need to know, do you have anything to cure hiccups? And the pharmacist said, go to aisle three. And so the guy goes to aisle three. He is there. He is looking at the different medications. The pharmacist sneaks up behind him. He jumps out and screams at him. He karate chops him in the neck. And the guy turns around and he goes, what are you doing? Why'd you do that for? And the pharmacist is like, well, notice you don't have hiccups anymore. And the guy said, I never had hiccups. It's my wife. She's in the car. She's got the hiccups. (laughs) My problem may not be your problem, and your problem may not be my problem, but I'm telling you, we all have different problems and needs, and Jesus has a cure for every single problem. That God gives us the power to do the impossible. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. Do you believe that? Turn to your neighbor right now and say it. With God, all things are possible. Go ahead, wake them up and tell them. Say it with me. With God, all things are possible. Say it again. With God, all things are possible. Do you believe that this morning? I'm telling you, several years ago, I took, I actually have the, I still have it in my office right now, an old-fashioned Webster's Dictionary, and I took that, and I took a carpet knife, an exacto knife, and I cut the word impossible out of my dictionary because the word impossible is not in God's vocabulary. Right before that, this was right after we'd gotten married, right before that, I cut the word divorce out of my dictionary because that would not be in mine and Jennifer's vocabulary. That divorce would not be an option for us. Now, she has said, never have I thought about divorce, murder, maybe. No, she didn't say say that. Seriously, she didn't say that. We're going to edit that out of the sermon, okay? (laughs) But I cut the word impossible because there's nothing impossible for God. You say, Pastor, what's the implication of you cutting the word impossible out of your dictionary? I don't really know because the word implication was on the other side of the page, and I cut it out as well. 
with God, all things are possible. But the flip side of that is we got to believe in God in order for him to do the impossible through us. And that requires faith. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are often told to do things that seem as though they are impossible. We are told to forgive people that have wronged us. And humanly, that is impossible. We are told to love our enemies. And humanly, that is impossible. It takes faith. You have to take him at his word and believe what he says. Belief is key to everything. I'll give you an example. Let's just say this morning that I were to come to you and I were to say, hey, listen, I want you to know I've purchased you two tickets to the the most difficult event to get tickets to in the world. That's right. A Taylor Swift concert. (laughs) No, I would would never do that. I would never do that. You're like, are you not a Swifty? No, I'm not. Really embarrassed that I even know what that word means. <laughs> even better, let's say I come up to you and I say, hey, listen, I've purchased you two 50-yard line tickets to next year's Super Bowl. It's going to be in Las Vegas. And so here's what you need to do. You need to get your tickets to fly to Vegas, and you're going to go to Allegiant Stadium to the will call window there, and those two 50-yard line tickets are going to be waiting on you in February for the Super Bowl. Now, you've got a choice to make. Am I going to believe the preacher or not? Isn't that a terrible choice? Am I going to believe what Stephen has said? If you believe what I said, then you're going to get your tickets. You're going to be like, this is so exciting. I'm going to buy new clothes, and it's going to be great. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to get my tickets. And if you don't believe me, you're just going to say, there's no way that he's done that. I don't don't trust him. I don't don't think he's telling the truth. That's not true. And you're going to choose not to go, and then those two tickets will remain unused at the Super Bowl. And you'll be watching the game, and you're like, there's the two empty seats that the preacher bought for me. Now, don't go to Vegas because I've not bought you tickets. But Super Bowl tickets, do you know they're harder to come by than Taylor Swift concert tickets? Makes sense. But you've got you've to make a decision. Am I going to trust? Am I going to believe what he has said to me? Friend, listen to me. I love the attitude of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Listen to what they say. They say the difficult we can do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. Their, 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 their formal motto is one word in Latin, esseons. You know what it means? Let us try. Let us try. I've not bought you tickets, but in this word, there are many promises and there are many offers that God has given to us. Will you claim them? That if you believe him at his word, you will. But if you don't believe him at his word, there are a lot of unclaimed blessings because you think that is just not possible. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, you will never accomplish the impossible until you attempt the impossible. Look at the life of Simon Peter. You know what Jesus said to Peter? Walk to me on the water. Peter could have said, I take him at his word. I've seen him do the impossible. I've seen him heal people. I've seen him do crazy, crazy things. I really believe what Jesus is saying here. But do you know when his faith became action? When he swung that leg over the boat and he walked out on that water, putting his entire weight on the water, that's when the power of God was released. Do you want to be made well? You've got to declare, I've got a problem you got to be willing to do the impossible. But then the third thing we notice, he departed his comfort zone. Are you willing to do that? You're like, what was his comfort zone? He had been there for 38 years. Imagine that for just a moment. What were you doing 38 years ago? Now, in case you, want, you don't want to do the math That was 1985. Some of you weren't even alive in 1985. But imagine 
that if you were in the same place doing the very same thing since 1985. Now, according to what John has wrote, this guy was not the only guy that was there at Bethesda. There were many, many other sick people at the pool. And it was common in Jerusalem for disabled people to gather together in a certain area and they would ask for alms, right? They would ask for money. It was, it was their welfare system. We also know this, that from ancient literature, that there was a protocol among beggars. Those with seniority, they got the best places to beg. They got the prime location. Don't you think after 38 years, this man probably had the prime location at Bethesda? And in one instant, Jesus didn't just tell him to stand up. What did Jesus tell him to do? Get up and take your mat. Take your bed and go on. He was asking him or he was telling him, take your comfort zone. Take where you've put your trust in being able to survive. Take it all. Friend, listen to me. There are many people today that really don't want to leave their comfort zone. They have it easy. That's why it's called a comfort zone. But by removing the mat, Jesus literally was saying, leave your comfort zone. That's the reason why Jesus said, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? The first danger is comfort. Because comfort leads to complacency. And the second danger is pride. Because pride leads to self-sufficiency. Oh, church, listen to me. For 13 years as your pastor, I've been praying, oh God, please do not let us be one of those Western world, casual, comfortable Christian churches. Friend, hear me. In this church, we have a great, great staff. In this church, God has blessed us with so many resources and so many amazing ministries. Just yesterday, I was over in our student building, and I was walking through. You know, they took that place away from us, I can't remember, several years ago. And they we're doing renovation over there to take that old kitchen and to make it into more classroom space for them. And as I was walking through, I'm like, this is where we used to have Wednesday nights. This is the kitchen that we used this is the small little room that we would feed and then I would do Bible study on Wednesday nights and it, it just floored me it, re, it reminded me of all the things that God has done for us but the danger of that is for us to grow comfortable and it can produce apathy and complacency and that you and I can begin to take God's blessings for granted and because we're such a large church, and because we're such a generous giving church, if we're not careful, that can produce inside of us this sense of pride. And if we don't humble ourselves before God, all of a sudden we'll begin to think that we're the ones that's done all this. We're the ones that's grown all this. We're the ones that's given to all this. And we can forget to depend upon the very power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say something that's going to flat blow your mind. It's not real deep. It just goes counter. It goes countercultural even within the church. Are you ready for this? God didn't save you to make you comfortable. What? Well, no, that's not what I was told. No, 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 no. I was told that he was going to save me so that I could be, I could be comfortable, right? Because God does want me happy. Again, God's not against your happiness, but God's much more concerned about your holiness. Well, well now hang on just a second, hang on just a second. I, 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 thought God, I thought God saved me because God wants me, to, uh, God wants me to have my best life yet. Well, friend, I want to tell you something. The life that God has given you is never meant to be exhausted in this world. The life that God has given you is meant to transcend this world. And God wants you to find your happiness, your holiness, right? Your, your, your help and your trust in not this life, but in the one who gives life. And he wants you to quit focusing on making a living that you lose this life. He did not save you to make you comfortable. And as churches, we say, come to Jesus. 
He wants you to be so happy. Come to Jesus. He wants you to be so comfortable. No, friend, he didn't save you to make you comfortable. He saved you to make you obedient. God did not save you to make you comfortable. He saved you to conform you into the very image of Jesus Christ. God did not save you to make you comfortable. He saved you to do a radical work in and through you that even you sat there and say, oh my goodness, look at the transformation that is taking place in my life. Look at the change that has occurred. I'm just saying, guys, God wants to do something through this church and he wants to do something through you to where not one single one of us could say, yep, I'm the one that did it. But instead, we sat there and we're like, oh my goodness, isn't our God big? Isn't our God able to do the impossible? I don't need to be in a comfort zone. Why? Because comfort zone, it makes me apathetic about everything. You'll never go on a mission trip until you're willing to leave your comfort zone. You'll never tithe until you're willing to leave your comfort zone. You will never verbally share your faith with anyone else until you leave your comfort zone. You'll never serve until you're willing to leave your comfort zone. You'll never start laboring in prayer until you're willing to leave your comfort zone. Do you want to be made well? You got to declare that you got a problem. You do the impossible. You depart your comfort zone. And then fourth, you ditch your past. After receiving a miracle, the paralyzed man left the pool. Later that day, Jesus found him in the temple. No doubt he was there to pray and thank God for his healing. And what did Jesus say? Stop sinning or something else worse will happen to you. Again, what was the question that Jesus asked the man at the pool? He didn't ask him, do you want to walk? What did he ask him? Do you want to get well? The word well means wholeness. Now, the man was walking, right? The man was now carrying his mat. But Jesus had to tell him how to be well. Jesus had to tell him how to be spiritually healed. He said, stop your sinning. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? First of all, let me tell you what he didn't mean. He did not mean that this man was suffering because of some sin in his life. There were folks who had it wrong then. There are folks that have it wrong today. There are folks that would lead you to believe that if any suffering happens in your life, it's because of some sin. Now, the reality is we live in a world that has suffering because of the sinful effects of living in this broken world, right? Because of what sin has harvested, what sin has brought about, as we say all the time. We live in this broken world, so we're going to have to live uh, with uh, broken lives because of the fallout of sin. But Jesus is not saying here that this guy was... He was lame because of any particular sin within his life. How do we know that? We're going to get to John chapter 9. There his disciples are going to be talking about a blind man. And they're going to ask Jesus the question, Hey, why was this guy blind? Was it because of his sin or because of his parents' sin? And Jesus said, well, he's not blind because of his sin nor his parents' sin. He was blind so that the power of God can be demonstrated. What did Jesus mean when he said, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you? I read that and I'm like, what's worse than being uh, lame for 38 years? What's worse than being paralyzed for 38 years? That's easy. Spending eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. Now, Jesus never condemned people as sinners, but he never condoned sin either. Jesus always said, unless you repent, you will all perish. What does the word repent mean? The word repent means to turn around. It means that when you come to Christ, you turn from your sin and you turn to Christ. That if you never repent from your sin, something worse than being paralyzed is going to happen to you. But here's what I love about this. Jesus was telling this man, no longer are you going to be defined by your past. 
No longer are you going to be known as the man who can't walk, the man who lays around begging, the man at the pool of Bethesda who is on a mat. No, you've got a new life in front of you. You've got a brand new reason to live. He said, I know you just spent 38 years there, but you'll not be returning to the pool. No, 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 your place as a beggar is no more. And Jesus Christ is telling us the very same thing, that when you come to Christ, you experience a brand new reason to live. If that's the case, then why do so many of us go around living life still chained to our past? Still in bondage, when you sit there and look and the Israelites have been delivered from Egypt, what happened? They got out into the wilderness and they're like, we don't have anything to eat. And God's like, all right, I'll give you something to eat. Angel cake, right here from heaven. Here you go. Well, I mean, we don't have any, we don't have any water. God's like, oh, that's all right, I'll give you some water. But remember, they're out there and they're like, we wish we were back in Egypt. We wish we were back in bondage. We wish we were back chained, slaves. Why? Because we were comfortable with that. I mean, it wasn't ideal, but we we knew what the day looked like. There are some of you that are walking around, and the devil is still trying to chain you to your past. You know who you were. You know what you did. You know the real you. Oh, you're playing this game, right? Oh, Oh, you're singing these songs. Oh, you're part of that church. Now, friend, listen to me. It is not through the church. It's not through the songs, but it is through a relationship with Jesus Christ that the transformation happens. And Jesus is saying, do you want to be made whole? And you're like, yes, Lord, by faith, by trust, I surrender and I come to you. And he's like, oh, okay, the old man's gone, and now you're a new man. I'll explain it this way. When you're driving your car, you're looking at two different pieces of glass. You got a big piece of glass, you got a little piece of glass. The big piece of glass, the windshield. The little piece of glass, the rearview mirror. How do you think it would go if you decided, you know what, I'm not going to look at this windshield anymore. I'm driving everywhere through the little piece of glass. I've seen some of you in the church parking lot. It almost looks like you're doing that. (laughs) I tell you, that parking lot back there, I wouldn't walk through that. You couldn't pay me enough money to walk through that parking lot after the services. That one right back there in the back. It's crazy. You're not going to do that. You're not going to drive around by the rear view mirror. No, no. what are you going to do? You're going to sit there and you're going to spend most of your time through the windshield only occasionally looking in the rear view mirror. I'm not saying you forget where you've come. I'm not saying you forget how you've been delivered. I'm just saying he saved you for more than for you just to sit and focus on where you've been, where you've come, and instead you sit there and you say, I think he's taking me somewhere else. I think he's changing me. I think he's doing something so impossible through me that those that are around me, even myself, will say, well, glory be to God. Only he could do something like that. Friend, listen to me. The past is a great place to visit but you don't want to live there you got to declare you have a problem you want to be made well you got to do the impossible you want to be made well you got to depart from your comfort zone you got to ditch your past and then fifth here's what's going to happen you'll describe to others what Jesus has done for you you look back in this text the poor disabled man did nothing to deserve this miracle it is only by the grace of God that he was able to walk And you and I would agree that there's nothing that we can do that is going to deserve the gift of salvation. It is only by the grace of Jesus that we are saved. This this guy goes to the religious leaders, and notice what he says here. He says, Jesus is the one. He didn't say who made me walk. What does he say? The one who made me well. It's the very same word Jesus used. He is the one who made me whole. Now, wouldn't you have loved to have been there to hear the testimony of this formerly disabled man in Jerusalem. I'm telling you, you'd probably show up at church on a Sunday night to hear his testimony. Well, for 38 years, I sat by the pool of Bethesda. And I was helpless and I was hopeless. And one day, it wasn't any special day like a normal day and 
I had hoped that I might could just make it in so I'd be healed. Giving wasn't quite that good that day, and all of a sudden, though, a man came up to me that I didn't know who he was. I'd never met him before. Seemed as though others may have known who he was. And he told me, or he asked me, do you want to be made well? And then he said, get up and walk. I later found out it was Jesus. And I'm just saying, I was going about my normal life, right? I was going about my every day. I, my faith was, was still trusting in, in what little bit of hope I might have had, right? Maybe I could just get a little bit of money. Maybe somebody could just give me a little bit of encouragement. But then Jesus steps in, and he flat blew my world all to pieces. And since that day, everything in my life has changed. And there are many people here today that are just like that man in this story. They've given up on their situation, refusing to believe that there is any hope that it can change. They see no way from human viewpoint, so they've resigned themselves to being weak and to being faltering, being this uh, failing individual for the rest of their lives. And I know that there are some among us because there always is. I don't know what your problem is. Maybe it could be that you've tried to stop drinking because you know that alcohol is ruining your life. It's ruining your family. It's ruining your home. You thought you had it under control. You tried to stop, but you discovered you couldn't stop. It's amazing to me, church, how many people casually feel like that they're in control of something when only it really has control of them. I was talking to a guy not too long ago and we were talking about smoking and he's like, man, I'm smoking. I'm smoking so many cigarettes every day. It's unbelievable. And I said, you know what? You just need to stop smoking. He said, oh, it's easy to stop smoking. I've done it a hundred times. And that is a revelation of how much it controls him. And many of you have tried to stop taking drugs, but you discovered that you are hooked in a habit that you began maybe just out of innocent experimentation, or maybe you began it because you had a doctor's prescription and it's gotten a hold of you and it's radically changed your world and you're like, I want to stop. Maybe you've given up wrestling this morning with this inner problem of lust or looking at pornography. I was talking to a young guy, a young guy just the other day, and he's like, oh, pornography has gripped my heart. It is ravaging my family and ravaging my marriage. Oh, if I could only quit, but I've tried and I just can't. Or perhaps you're here and you're like, you know what? I don't have any hope for my marriage. I've tried everything I know how. I've tried to correct things. You've asked for help, but you're like, it seems as though nobody even cares. And it seems as though it just gets worse and worse and worse. All I'm saying is this, that there are many people today that are exactly right where this man was, and they have this sense of helplessness and this sense of hopelessness, and they're like, I'd love to make a change, but I can't make a change because it's impossible. And yet Jesus asked every one of us, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? And you say, yes. And he says, okay, believe me. Get up. Take your mat. And go. One last thing and we'll close. Some of you like me as I study the scripture, I'll write questions out. Huh, what about this? Or I'd like to ask this. And One question that I ask is this. John makes it clear there were a lot of sick people there that day. Out of all the sick people, why did Jesus choose this one? This man. Out of all of them, why him? To ask the question, do you want to be made well? We don't know. We don't know. You're like, well, I was reading a book and a guy said, well, he's just guessing. He don't know. Anybody who would tell you that they do know, hmm, probably need to quit reading their book. We really don't know. But you know what? I thought this. Out of all the people 
that Jesus could have saved, why did he choose a boy named Stephen Kyle in North Mississippi in 1979? I don't know. But I sure am glad he did. And today, he is standing here and he is saying, do you want to be made well? Trust me. Leave your past. Leave your comfort zone. Admit you got a problem. I'm calling you to the impossible. Now come. Follow me. He is saying that to you today. A lot of questions we don't have the answers to. But I can tell you this, based upon the authority of God's word. If you'll humbly call out to him today, turn from your sin. He'll make you whole. And he'll change you. And he'll transform you. Would you bow your heads with me today? With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. We now come to the point of response. What will I now do with the very words of Scripture as they've been made known? First of all, there are many of you in this room that while you know that heaven will be your home, you've got it settled that your eternity is going to be with Jesus, that when you die, you'll go to be with him. The reality is that there are still many of you you're trying to drive that spiritual car using the rearview mirror. He saved you from more than just to rescue you from your past. He wants to change you. Trust him. Trust him. Would you do that today? Lord, you've delivered me from a long, long way. And Lord, while I'm not all that I want to be, I'm thankful that you're not through with me yet. Would that be your prayer? Some of you guys just need to lay that chain down before you walk out of here. Lay the past, lay the baggage. Well, if I could go back and do it different, we all would, friend. We all would. He didn't call you to go back. He calls you today. Get up. Take that mat. Walk on. And then there are others of you in this room. The reality is you don't know Jesus. You don't have a relationship of salvation with him. That if today were to be your last day, you would say, well, I hope I'd go to heaven. I've lived a good life. Friend, the Bible makes it very clear that God has removed that as a way to get to heaven because none of us can live the perfect life that's required. But today Jesus says, trust me with your soul. Trust me with your salvation. Trust me. Come to me. That you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm ready to do that. I'm ready to turn to Jesus. Would you call out to him right now? In prayer. Man, I can remember back in 1979 when the Holy Spirit of God was dealing with me in a service just like this. Oh, it was a lot smaller, but the Spirit was just as thick. And I can remember crying out to him in prayer. Now, please hear me, friend. I didn't put my faith in a prayer. That prayer... That was the way that I was confessing the overflow of my heart. I said, Jesus, I need you to save me. Please save me. I want you to come into my life. I put my faith and trust in you, Lord. I want to follow you all the days that I have left. Save me. 
And friend, he'll do the very same thing for you. He'll save you. He'll change you. He will make you whole. Would you cry out to him right now? Just pray that prayer just like that, expressing the belief that you have in your heart. In just a moment, we'll stand. There are going to be pastors down front. You're here today, and you say, today I give my life to Jesus. I'm unashamed. I profess him as Lord. We're going to invite you to come. Walk to one of these pastors and just say that. Today I give my life to Jesus. Others of you, this altar's open. You'd come and pray. God, help me to get out of the rearview mirror and start focusing on the windshield. Others of you, Pastor, I need to be obedient to the Lord in this. Come on. Oh, God, may you speak. May we listen. And more importantly, may we be doers and not just hearers so that you'll get glory through it all. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray.